Welcome everybody to the September episode of ISSA Canada's Coffee Talk Forum. On the coattails of last week's International Housekeeping and Environmental Services Awareness Week, this episode will look at the healthcare housekeeping and EVS sector, as well as the resources available to enable their success. If we've learned anything over the last three years, it's the importance of cleaning and disinfection, not only in commercial, institutional, industrial and residential settings, but perhaps more importantly in our healthcare facilities and long-term care homes. Can you imagine if we had inexperienced teams cleaning and disinfecting our hospitals and healthcare facilities? Not only would patients be in danger, but so would the health of our doctors and nurses. To say that housekeeping and EVS staff are not part of any healthcare team would be a fallacy. Their expertise and knowledge on how to keep our facilities clean and safe is just as important as a medical professional making that crucial diagnosis. Both play a key role in keeping our hospitals safe and healthy. For many on the outside looking in, The healthcare housekeeper and EVS professional are an enigma. What does a day in the life of these critical industry players look like? What are their pain points? And what resources are out there to help? To help us answer these questions, I'm pleased to introduce our special guests today. Wendy Boone is the Executive Director of the Canadian Healthcare Housekeepers Association, a division of ISSA. Making her start in the hospitality sector in 1980, Wendy made the move to the healthcare sector in 1984. She was first introduced to CHHA's former iteration, the Ontario Healthcare Housekeepers Association, in the mid 80s, taking on the position of regional chair representing the Ottawa area region nine. Wendy soon found herself employed at OHHA as a part-time administrative secretary, but as the years passed and as her responsibilities grew, she soon found herself as the organization's executive director in 2014. Also joining us today is Julie Holflack. Julie is an advisory advisory council member at CHHA and CHHA, Education Chair. There's too many H's in there, Wendy. <laughs> Julie has been involved in the healthcare, house, health, healthcare sector for 11 years and is currently working at all five sites of Hamilton Health Sciences. In her current role as CSS Leader Trainer, she is responsible for all education, training, orientation, and more for the Environmental Services, Transportation, and Nutritional Services staff. Welcome, ladies, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me and us, I guess. Us, thanks for having us, absolutely. (laughs) Awesome. So let's start with the basics. Not Not all of our guests joining us today are directly involved in the healthcare housekeeping or EBS sector for that matter. So can you tell us exactly what is what is a healthcare housekeeper and or environmental services specialist? Is there a difference between the two? I'm just gonna I'm gonna just start this, uh, Tanya, and and thanks for having us today. We're really uh, we're really excited to be here. Um, so I'm gonna let Julie elaborate, but it depends on the facility uh, it, whether it, the the position is the same and whether the facility has uh, some of their staff are considered multi skilled depends on the size of the facility. Um, So I'm gonna let Julie uh, jump in on this because she's hands-on right in the thick of things there at Hamilton Health Sciences. So hi, so um, in our facilities, there is a distinction between the two. So we actually have two different bodies that do the cleaning in all of our healthcare facilities. So we have a contracted cleaning service that comes in, that's our core housekeeping. So what, healthcare housekeepers in my facilities are if they're a core housekeeper they're cleaning all our public areas all our non inpatient areas so they'll clean our cafeterias our public washrooms our hallways but they're also cleaning our outpatient clinics like our cancer center for they're doing interventional radiology they're doing our chemo suites 
areas where patients don't stay. They're also primarily um, responsible for our waste handling. So our environmental aides, which are working in our clinical units, will package the waste and Crothall, our core housekeeping, will come and remove it and store it and see that it gets to the trucks and all that kind of stuff. So that's your basic housekeeper. Um, our environmental aides, which are uh, is our customer support services, so our environmental aides are actually working on our clinical units. And they are called environmental aids specifically because not only are they cleaning and disinfecting patients' rooms, they're also supporting the entire in environment. So they're cleaning mobile equipment. They're cleaning nursing stations. They are, if a transport or a porter isn't available on some units, they're doing stat blood runs. They're doing stat specimen runs. They're picking up albumin, things like that. Our environmental aides also assist in transferring patients. They will also in certain departments like our emergency departments, our operating rooms, our same day surgery departments. They will also transport staff or fill in for the healthcare aides break. So if the healthcare aides on lunch, our environmental services are helping to boost patients or helping to move patients and transport patients as well. That doesn't happen quite as often as getting mobile equipment for staff and doing specimens and blood runs though. Holy, yeah. So you basically answered the, 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 the next question I had being in healthcare, there's obviously some, there's different challenges faced by these teams. Is oh, it, Wendy, did you want to have some, did you have something to say there? No, I'm good. No, Jewel, I was just saying the same thing, Tanya, that she did, uh, she actually did ask you. Yeah. Well, I've, I've actually got more to add to that. Okay, well, so, we do. So when, when you have, um, when we have our environmental aides or you have a housekeeper that is responsible for um, assisting healthcare aides or clinical staff, there are very distinct, distinct challenges that we're faced with and and that all falls within scope of practice mm -hmm. so you know so a little support becomes oh well a little bit more and and they keep pushing the line so I have seen EAs and transport staff be in the situation where a patient just came back from a test and they've been transferred to the bed the EAs there and the nurse will say oh hey they're on uh number two level oxygen. Can you please plug this into the wall and turn it to level two and give the patient their nose prongs? So now we're just, yeah. now we just stepped out of scope of practice, mm -hmm. right? So you have to be very clear and you have to be very definitive where the EA scope of practice ends and the healthcare scope of practice begins. And that can even be problematic in the healthcare role because we have two different types of healthcare aides, right? We have a technical and we have a clinical, right? So yeah. technical goes to school for college, clinical is trained on site. So it's even easier to blur the lines of scope with those aides. So environmental aides don't do any patient care. They don't deal with any medication. They don't deal with extreme amounts of body fluids. They would never dress a patient. They would only reposition a patient if a nurse was there and nobody else could help them, right? We're not cutting up patient's food. That's another kind of blurred line there, right? Because there, it's things that seem so simple. Well, I had kids, I cut my own food, I can cut my patient's food out, but there's a lot more involved in that. Yeah. So the biggest challenge is scope of practice and bleeding and bleeding in and out of those lines. So Julie, in a case like that, like do, do each of the, the hospitals have specific scope of practices or is there a standard? So most scope of practices comes from the governing college or the governing licensing body, right? So, okay. um, so environmental services doesn't have a licensing body yet, hopefully maybe in the future that will kind of come. Um, but a healthcare aid has a scope of practice guideline from the college, they clinical staff, nursing staff do, it still gets blurred. Yeah. So that's kind of where I come in, right? So when I'm not training, okay. so um, when I'm not training new employees, then I go to the gamma, I go to where the work's happening and I will, um, like my office is at Jurabinsky, but I will hang out at all our other sites and just kind of round and observe and, 
do retraining and re-education on the spot should I see that happening um and then I'll do like education blasts and things like that so so kind of avoid that um wow. it's boots on the ground really it's boots on the ground yeah so in terms of boots on the ground how many how many generally comprise an EBS staff or a housekeeping staff in, in, in the in the healthcare sector. Obviously, it's going to vary by facility size. Yeah. Yeah. So it varies by facility size and um, unit needs, right? So um, general rule of thumb, um, what we do here is we typically say an environmental aid is going to be responsible, depending on the size of the unit, for anywhere from 11 patient bed spaces up to 22. Wow. Because we'll have units that have 24 patients on it, and we have units that have 87 patients on it. And then, uh, but that doesn't mean that our units that have 87 or have tw like 20 patients doesn't mean that they only get one EA or two EAs. That might be a unit where there's a lot of blood runs happening or there's a lot of other work happening. So we're looking at the bed space where we say basic methodology, 20 minutes per bed space, right? So you okay. kind of break it down that way. Um, and then you have to factor into that into that 20 minute bed space time for our facility also includes mobile equipment runs and anything like that for nursing staff. Right. So um, depending on the heaviness of the unit, the acuity of the patients that are on that unit will determine how many staff we have and what time staff are working. So um, staff may not be on a unit 24 seven, but we may have our ICU. We need EAs there 24 /7. Oh, no. staff with 40 beds actually has five staff working yeah. where other units with 40 beds would have two. Oh yeah. Wow. Can you can you give everybody just an idea for at Hamilton Health Sciences, for example, yeah. how many full-time, how many FTEs like you would have and part-time and casual for all the sites? So I there's I I can't actually give oh. that. I I can tell you well so <laughs> So Jurabinsky, well, so what I, yeah, huh, that's a hard question. So our Jurabinsky site has a total of 286 EAs wow. and we have about 52 working a day, um, like during the day, right? And then we'll have probably about another uh, 20 working in the evening. Um, Hamilton General, we have th just over 300 EAs, um, and it's still pretty much the same working. St. Peter's, our smaller sites, we have 50 EAs, and we have two, four, six, eight, 20 working a day. Holy, wow. Right? So, so it really, really depends. So my department, um, EAs, Porters, and Nutrition, across all five sites, I have 1,100 staff. Wow that I'm responsible to educate and train and do all that and, and fit test. I fit test them as well. So, um, yeah. And about, there's about 700 of those, maybe just over 700 are EAs and close to just about 250 are porters and the rest are nutrition associates. Now, when you, when you talk about fit training, what, what exactly does that mean? Oh, your N95 mask. Okay, gotcha. All right. So over the past few years, the cleaning industry has, has seen a major spotlight placed upon it. How have housekeeping and EVS teams struggled over these past few years? Well, there's been lots of... Uh, Julia, or Julia, I'll just uh, hop in a little bit and then you can elaborate a little bit more. From my standpoint, we we what I hear from my from members is that there's been a uh, uh, considerable staff shortage. Uh, the turnover of staff has been higher than usual. A lot of people that were uh, close to retirement decided when COVID hit, I'm out of here. So they uh, they've, they've taken their retirement. Um, it's, uh, to, for a bonus and long time overdue is we've, we've seen the housekeeping EBS get the recognition 
that they deserve, that they've deserved for a long, long time. And it's sad that the pandemic had to do that, but that's, yeah. that. yeah, that's, that's how I see things. I mean, like Julie's hands-on, like, uh, so Julie probably has some other things she'd like to add as well. Yeah. So we have always had staffing challenges before COVID. Um, so, and that's probably the nature of, in part of that is the nature in which we hire. So when you're hired with Hamilton Health Sciences, you're hired into an on-call ca um, casual position. So we guarantee you no hours. You have, you're on call 24 seven. If you don't pick up so many shifts, we fire you. So, so that wow. is problematic, right? That's yeah. a problem there too. But just as Wendy had said, yeah, we saw a large exodus mm -hmm. um, in March. Uh, when COVID first hit, a ton of staff retiring. Uh, then the start going into the third wave, when people were start the third and fourth wave, people were like, I'm done with this. I'm retiring again. But um, we're also seeing a really change, a different change in the generation that's working. So um, okay. I'm a woman in my mid fifties heading to my 60s. And so our generation, I think we're the last generation that said, work, 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 you're going to have a good life when you retire. Right? Yeah. Right? Oh, yes. Um, so the work, the work life balance, there was no such thing. What do you mean a work life balance? No, we work our fingers to the bone, and then we retire and get to be happy. Yeah. But the millennials, and that generation behind us, that's not their mindset. Yeah. And so, I mean, a lot, I, I, and don't take this wrong if you guys are millennials on this, but I mean, mo millennials really kind of get a bad rap. Yeah. And that's one of the things they get a bad rap for. Yeah. But to be totally honest, they're doing it right. Mm -hmm. Why would you yeah. work 95% <laughs> of your time and have, like, why, why would your work balance be 70% at work and 30 at home? Right. So, mm -hmm. so we already started before the pandemic hit seeing, because I do all the new employees, I already started seeing a shift. People don't want to be on call 24 seven. It doesn't fit into their lifestyle. It doesn't work. It doesn't work with families. It doesn't work with mental health. Yeah. Right. So they're not doing that anymore, right? I'll work when I have to work. And then when I'm at home, I'm at home and there's not going to be work involved with that. Um, we saw that happening. COVID also really stressed that. So all of a sudden the world was locked away with their families, a mm -hmm. world that probably didn't spend that much time with their families mm -hmm. before, right? Really? And now they're like, hey, I kind of liked that. Or, you know, we could survive. Mm. It kind of changed our pri priorities a little bit, right? <laughs> yep. As well. Well, Julie, th those comments, you know, I, I always I always used to think that, you know, the millennials, there's no work ethic there. But listening to you, I... I it, it is so true. It is so true. So in terms of, of, of turnover, and I'm going to go back to another question in a minute, but how do, how do you guys deal with the, with the labor shortages? Because I can assure you there's multiple people on this call today that are faced with the, the same, same things. How do you draw people in, especially with the COVID infection, disease, to get people to come to work? Um, yeah, so that's, that's the question, right? So yeah. it's so funny, I was in a meeting yesterday, and we were asking the same thing, how do we do it? How do we get people working? And I, I have no real answer to that. Um, we are so normally, I would recruit about five to 600 new employees a year, that includes EVS, transport staff and nutrition services. So I would do orientation once a month in the summer, we'd be busy, I do it a couple of times a month. Um, so far, so we changed the way we do re recruit, we are continuously recruiting and continuously interviewing now. So I have set up my schedule where every other week, five days a week, I'm doing some sort of orientation. Wow. Um, so from January until the beginning of June, we onboarded 567 staff. Wow. Oh, wow. Good. Yeah. Not yeah. good. Cause we still need more. Oh, geez. <laughs> right. So, yeah. but, but that is problematic with how we have our, um, 
how we have our workforce structured. So we only hire on-call casual. So literally you're on call 24 seven. Well, who, like you can't go away when we give you the call at five o'clock in the morning or 11 o'clock at night, you gotta be to work within, you know, an, an hour, you don't know where you're working. Can anybody plan a life with that? No. 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 Yeah. Um, and to be totally honest with you, the wage differences and the wage gaps aren't as large anymore. So at Hamilton Health Sciences, we're paying about $23 an hour, 23 and 23.47, I think it is, mm -hmm. plus 14% in lieu of benefits. Oh, wow. Well, here in Hamilton, Amazon just arrived and they're paying $22 an hour, full benefits off the hop, and they're guaranteeing them full-time or part-time hours. We guarantee them no hours. Right. So in the past, twenty three seventy five or whatever, plus 14 percent in lieu of benefits was worth the struggle when you're leaving a twelve dollar an hour job. But when you're only looking at a three or four different pay rate, like mm -hmm. weight raise difference. Yeah. Right. It's, yeah. it's a different ball game. It's yeah. a do I want the three dollars an hour more or do I want guaranteed hours and do I want a guaranteed home life? Yeah. So healthcare has to kind of, uh, or we do specifically, are in the process of rethinking that, yeah. right? Yeah. Or like coming in and uh, because people can survive easier on a set income than kind of a wishy-washy income. Yeah. And to be totally honest with you, people coming in are not worried about the viruses and the bacteria. Like COVID taught us that, that viruses live everywhere. So you are no safer getting your groceries at Walmart than, you know, working in a hospital. So I think the whole yeah. idea of being nervous about coming in contact with viruses and things like that really isn't the determining factor anymore for not working in healthcare. Yeah. Well, I, I was going to ask that because it, when it, you're already in the hospital, you're already a housekeeper or environmental services, you're already having to deal with those infectious diseases and, and keeping your patients and everybody within that facility safe. So mm -hmm. this, this was in place long before COVID, oh, but wow. when COVID, when COVID did hit, like, were there already procedures in place to help deal with that. I mean, it was unknown. So I guess there, it was fluid and people were learning along the way, but how did, do, did the hospitals or, or I'd love, I'd love to get some comment about long-term care homes. Cause that made major headlines, so, you know, in the first few months, Yeah, absolutely. like how, how was that dealt with? So if I can just jump in, just I just want to go back for a little bit on on Julie's comment about um, on salary. Uh, sure. for and I think the hospitals are pretty much on the same playing field across the province. I'm, I'm not sure about outside of Ontario, but I know with long term care homes and and we've struggled with this for a long, long time. Uh, for example, during COVID, I got an email from a uh, HR person at Carlton Lodge in Ottawa, which is a municipally run home. Mm -hmm. He wanted me to advertise on our site a position for a frontline cleaner. The rate was $28 an hour. Oh, that's good. Plus yeah. benefits. So and then, and then I can be having a conversation with one of our members in Tavistock in a long-term care home doing exactly the same work that this person at the municipally run home in Ottawa is, is doing. They're just over minimum wage. So, <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, yeah. so, and, and I, I don't even know what we can do. I mean, we've been doing some work with, uh, with the Ontario long-term care association, you know, to try to push that, but I, I don't know if we can, we can. And then of course, all the PSWs got all the limelight during COVID. Uh, they got a bit of a pay increase, but our, our frontline staff didn't. So, hmm. yeah, well, like we see that within Hamilton Health Sciences. So REAs are making 23 and change an hour, but um, our Crawthall group yeah. are capping out at 19. Yeah, and they're doing exactly the same thing in the same environment. Hmm. They're actually, and they're dealing with waste even more than we are. So technically they're dealing with, and um, they're dealing with our chemo suite. So they're actually dealing with some, with, uh, with our higher risk areas. Yeah. 
than some of our regular EA, EAs are. Yeah. So what, yeah. what I saw, Tanya, going into the pandemic with long-term care was a, a lot of facilities, I think, realized that they didn't have the qualified supervisor manager in place. They didn't have the proper mm -hmm. training. Mm -hmm. um, the same with their frontline staff. So we saw a huge uh, intake of our EVS leadership program and our frontline program. And I know, Julie, you can probably talk to this. And I know that a lot of the hospitals uh, did put uh, a plan in place so that they were helping some of the long-term care facilities within their uh, you know, geographical location, uh, providing infection prevention and control um, you know, practices and, and guidelines and that sort of thing. But, but Julie can, Julie can uh, give more information on that. Yeah, I, I think if we look at COVID, so I, 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 I'm probably the only person on earth that I absolutely loved COVID and <laughs> <laughs> thought it was absolutely fantastic. Uh, just simply because it, you know, EVS is in the basement, not only in the basement of all the facilities, right? Because I don't know, everybody yep. else is working in long-term care. My offices are in the basement. My guys start out in the basement and we are figuratively in the basement, right? Um, mm. But COVID definitely shined a light on long-term care for issues that were already there before COVID. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so COVID didn't cause our long-term care issues. COVID brought a light to our long-term care issues. And so I was part of the SWAT team that went into all those lovely, no, like newsworthy facilities mm -hmm. that were on the news in Hamilton area. So some of them I went into, but other ones, I just, I did their training programs for them and did all their training education and materials for them. So um, long-term care from the long-term care facilities that I went into, I've been into some really beautiful ones and I've been into some really not so great ones. And the difference between the beautiful ones and the not great ones, obviously leadership and qualified leadership and educated leadership, as Wendy said, but was a limited use on the multi-skilled worker. Right. So a worker can only be multi skilled so far. Right. So in the really the long term care facilities that were having a hard time, their housekeeper delivered the meal trays, did maintenance, fixed holes in the wall, helped prepare the meals, helped move patients to patios, helped put laundry away. And there was one of them for 40 beds. Wow. Yeah. Just can't sustain that. Like yeah. our flu numbers in long-term care and our deaths from flu weren't as significant as with COVID, but we're still beyond what we needed to have happen in long-term care. It just wasn't advertised as much, right? Mm -hmm. So then we also have a problem with privately funded long-term care facilities. Yeah. So if they have money, it's going to be for, you know, building maintenance, it's going to be for food, it's going to be for resident activities, it's going to be for staff, it's not going to be for cleaning chemicals, properly, proper cleaning chemicals, right? When you're paying $200 for a bucket of wipes that has 160 wipes in it, they're going to go with, you know, the vinegar and the bleach or whatever, right? So they were using bleach, they were using water, that's fine. Then the pandemic hit and they can't even get those cleaners anymore because everybody's taken them off the shelves from the grocery store and they don't have a chemical vendor anymore because they didn't use one because it was too expensive. So now they're cleaning with literally vinegar and lemon juice. I walked into healthcare facilities and they're cleaning with vinegar and lemon juice. Yeah. Some of them were cleaning with Mr. Clean and we know that's not a proper disinfectant. Yeah, no. Yeah. Right. So and because COVID now, like Mr. Clean, actually, believe it or not, and well, bleach, obviously, COVID's an easy virus to kill. Easier than rhinovirus, easier than norovirus. Right. Um, so your run of the mill household cleaners, your Lysols will actually kill COVID. Mm -hmm. The problem is, though, they're not cleaning enough. They're not cleaning um, as frequently. They're not cleaning the high touch points. They're going in, looking at a room, saying it looks clean. That's good. I'm walking away 
because COVID stays alive on the surface for 72 hours outside of body fluids, COVID just kept building, 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 building. It didn't die off soon enough and they didn't have the proper chemicals. Mm -hmm. So that's where they kind of, plus the nature of their staff, there's sick staff and they're elderly, right? There are prime net sick hosts, right? In that chain of infection. Mm -hmm. So it just kind of was an all of a sudden, everything caught up with them. Mm -hmm. And COVID kind of forced that mm -hmm. we would have eventually have seen things like this happening in long-term care outside of COVID. It would have eventually happened. Oh, absolutely. COVID yeah. pushed it. COVID yeah. pushed it. Well, you, you know, it, Wendy, you and I have been working together a long time, not only in, in working with you through ISSA, but long before that, when, when I was doing sanitation Canada uh -huh. and it was always the, the ongoing dilemma that the, the <laughs> hospitals had to face that when there was budget cuts, it always hit in the, in the cleaning housekeeping departments first. Uh -huh. Has there been a change in that now? Julie will say there has been, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if Julie's the, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing it's, there has been, they're leaving EVS alone, you know, a little yeah. bit now, but I mean, Julie can, uh, and she can tell you what's going on in Hamilton Health Sciences. Yeah. So I, when that, where that comes into play, I kind of live in the land of milk and honey there to be totally honest with you i mean um hamilton health sciences is the second largest healthcare corporation in ontario yeah. uh uhn being the largest mm -hmm. um so we don't run into a situation where if we're a leader short um then we're working a leader short we don't do that like um we post out and we get another leader or we we post in and we get somebody internally right they hop on our chha course and away they go. Um, other facilities, though, from colleagues and peers of mine, I have heard that if the EVS manager leaves or they want to cut, they combine departments. So mm -hmm. now you have maintenance combined with um, EVS and you have the manager of maintenance is now the manager of housekeeping. They just kind of blend. So how we do it at Hamilton Health Sciences is we have corporate services and my portfolio falls under corporate services. So under corporate services, we have customer support services, which is your EAs and porters. Okay. We have logistics, we have maintenance, we have parking, we have volunteers <laughs> and we have nutrition services. So they're all like multi, like different smaller departments underneath one large corporate services but we would never combine. We brought nutrition services into customer support services, okay. but then we removed logistics from customer support services. Mm -hmm. So we wouldn't combine departments and leave with one, um, with one supervisor. Mm -hmm. So my supervisors right now have anywhere between 45 and 52 direct reports. Okay. So at Hamilton General, I have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five full time and one part time supervisor. Jurabinski has four full time supervisors and one part time. St. Peter's has one full time, one part time supervisor. West Lincoln mm -hmm. just has one full time supervisor. McMaster has four full time and one part time. Mm -hmm. And those numbers wouldn't change mm -hmm. because the, the number of our staff haven't changed. So yeah. the number of our supervisors are dictated by the number of our staff. So our supervisors would never have more than 52 direct reports and would never have less than 45. Yeah. Wow. I think, Tanya, in some of the smaller facilities, um, yeah. uh, long-term care, but in even smaller hospitals, because I, I've just noticed in the last couple of months, so we, we have three educational programs, the infection control, laundry and linen, housekeeping methodology. Mm -hmm. and we developed these many years ago and these programs were specifically for those people that may already be the lead in nutrition or maintenance. Okay. Their VP, CEO, whatever has asked them to take on the EBS department. So they don't need they know all their HR stuff. They, they know their risk management, their occupational health and safety. They know all that. But what they do need are the housekeeping EVS specific 
laundry, housekeeping methodology and infection control. So, so I've seen, it's funny, just in the last few weeks, I've seen a lot of people registering for our housekeeping methodology course. Wow. Yeah. And, I, oh. and I usually like to have a conversation with them yeah. first and say, you know, what are you currently doing? Because I want to make sure that we get you into the right program. There's no sense doing leadership if you, you know, you've already been a food service manager for X number of years. So let's go this route instead. So, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, Wendy, talking about uh, CHHA, it, it, they're the backbone for the EBS sector. Can you give us a little bit of background on your organization? Absolutely. <laughs> so, the, uh, the, the OHHA um, started back in 1957. We've been here for a long, long time. Um, so we used to be uh, an allied member of the Ontario Hospital Association. Uh, so it was at an Ontario Hospital Association back in 1957. There was a group of EVS housekeeping. Well, it probably wasn't called EVS then. It was probably housekeeping. Yeah. Uh, managers and supervisors got together and said, hey, let's create a not-for-profit association. So uh, that's what they did back then. And we just continued to grow. Uh, we partnered with uh, the University of Windsor to create the housekeeping methodology, laundry and linen, and the um, infection control program. Uh, we then worked with the Ontario Hospital Association and George Brown College to develop the what is now our EVS leadership program that used to be a million years ago. So I'm going back to the early 80s. Uh, early 80s, it was two courses, the housekeeping supervisors course and the executive housekeepers course. They then became EVS level one and level two. And then most recently, those two were combined together to, uh, to become the EVS leadership program. Yeah, so we've been, yeah, we've been around for a long, long time. Uh, we've operated with a volunteer board of directors um, from 1957 until 2020 when we merged with the ISSA. Um, so we fall under the ISSA's uh, uh, bylaws now and all of our, we have advisory council members now that used to be our, our directors on the board. Um, we have an education chair. Yeah, and they're all people that have been in the industry and have like a zillion years of experience. So, yeah. So now, why why the merge with ISSA? This was well, a this was a, a growth strategy for oh, you. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. So we we've, we've it's it's always been. I'm mean, some of you probably remember Roger Gobo. Roger Gobo was uh, mm. he he held all positions on our board. Um, he was actually, I think, our education chair when I came on the board in 1984. So it's always been uh, a goal of our forefathers of our association to become a national association. Um, so with the merger with ISSA, it allowed us to have more resources to, to grow the association across Canada. Um, we're the only association that represents healthcare. We don't, you know, we don't have members that, well, we do have some, I guess, that represent hotel, motel, uh, contract cleaners, um, hospitality, education, because our focus has always been, because we are an allied member of the Ontario Hospital Association, our focus has always yeah. been healthcare. Yeah. Uh, so that's the plan. Uh, numbers are starting to grow across uh, Canada. We've always had members from, uh, Prince Edward, Prince, or from Prince Edward Island and from, um, from BC, we've always had members from there, but we're starting to see them coming in from different provinces across, uh, across Canada. So, yeah, so it's, so, been, uh, it's been a bonus. It's been uh, a great experience with the merger. Yeah. Great. No, that's all. Aw that's awesome. Now I know you've already touched on some of the educational offerings, but I'd like to get in there a little bit deeper in the interest sure. of in the interest of time, because you do have so much to offer. Like, can you go over your courses? Maybe just explain, like, are they, they most of them are online self-guided, right? They are. So just to go back a, a well, a couple of years. So <laughs> we use all of our courses used to be uh, stacked on the shelves in my office, uh, all printed in binders, ready to roll. And uh, they used to be mailed out to people. Uh, so it was 2018 that we put our EVS frontline course online. 
Um, shortly after we put that online, we created a mentored and a mentorless version. Um, so the mentored version of our frontline course, um, there are two, there's eight modules in both the mentored and the mentorless. Uh, there are two modules in the mentored version that a mentor has to mark those assignments. So okay. the action control section or module and the um, occupational health and safety, and then the final exam. With the mentorless uh, version of that, it's all autocorrect. They go through, it's exactly the same content, but the students on their own, they do everything online. It autocorrects. Uh, they have an opportunity to go back in and redo assignments and quizzes if they haven't achieved the percentage that they need to achieve. So that's our frontline course. Then we have, I spoke to our housekeeping methodology, laundry and linen and infection control. Uh, we, we, we call those, I call those our professional development uh, courses. And then our leadership program, EVS leadership program, which was a program that we, um, we merged a few years back. Um, yeah, that's it. So we've got six courses and now we've just completed the translation of our EVS frontline course into French. Wow. Oh, congratulations. Uh, yeah, we're pretty happy about that. Yeah. So we're hoping it's probably going to be mid-October before that gets launched. Mm -hmm. um, We've already secured a couple of, uh, of our members that are uh, bilingual, so they'll be uh, the first two mentors for that program. Um, I think that's all. It's a bit of course. Yeah, everything's done online, Tanya. Um, they all have different um, timelines that they have to complete. The EVS leadership program is a one-year program. Right. Um, we found several students that had registered for that program before COVID hit needed extensions. So we've been, you know, fairly flexible mm -hmm. granting extensions to those students because most of them are working yeah. full time, some part time. Um, and then our professional development courses are a six month, uh, six month runtime. The frontline course uh, is uh, we allow six months, but they can finish it. They can finish it uh, quicker than that. So yeah, and these are all certifications, right? All certifications. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Per Perfect. Yeah. Now, you you had mentioned to uh, we've had this discussion as well about differences in in the provincial health guidelines. How does that come into play with 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 the courses? This is just a standard like your courses are a standard that pretty much encompass all health care, right? Correct. But we do follow and Julie's going to jump in. We do follow uh, because we have been an Ontario-based association. We yeah. do follow PIDAC okay. um, guidelines, um, and those, yeah, we there's a there's reference in most of our courses to the PIDAC document. Um, I'm going to let Judy, Judy, Julie, jump in on uh, on this one. Yeah, so this is where um, EVS is just really sadly lacking. So, and what I mean by that is, is we actually, so PIDAC is uh, based on the province. So Ontario has a PIDAC, Alberta has a PIDAC. They're, they're pretty similar, but not similar in the same time, right? Like there's slight differences there. Uh, we have Health Canada that puts out guidelines and you have the WHO that puts out guidelines, the CDC that puts out guidelines. Um, we also do have a Canadian standard. So that came out from the CSA, which actually, to be honest, uh, so the CHHA worked on that. Um, the problem with the CSA guidelines, and so if anybody's a CSA person, like a Canadian Standards Association, I don't mean them any disrespect. They're a fantastic organization, but they're not free to everybody. Those standards aren't free. So now we have developed this Canadian standard, which should be adopted by all provinces, but you have to pay for it. Now, I, I think it's like $115. So it's not like it's a crazy amount of money, mm -hmm. but when you already have something like PIDAC coming from Ontario and you have PIDAC coming from Alberta and Alberta Health, that's mm -hmm. free are we going to go to the CSA standards or if we don't have to pay for it and if it's hard to get and like, that's yeah. the thing, right? Yeah. Now, healthcare facilities are using a lot of CSA standards as far as electrical work, HVAC, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
because there are no other standards. Yeah. So we really need to all kind of start coming together as a whole. So the CSA, the CSA group did a fantastic job of doing those standards, but maybe lacked in marketing those standards yeah. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. marked uh, maybe lacked in distributing those standards. So I hope, and I think it's going to like, cause we're not out of COVID yet, but I think it's coming um, right now. Everybody's really focused on long-term care standards and those long-term scan term care standards are really are being redeveloped now, but very extensively redeveloped, right? Mm -hmm. So they're looking in the level of cares and nature of care and kind of dividing it that way. So I think once the world gets done that, I, I think there's opportunity to start looking at EVS again and saying, okay, we have to standardize. I think our courses lead to that. That'll become, that'll start once you start having certificate programs, professional organizations, and once we get out there more, then there will be more of an awareness and an understanding that we need to have a Canadian mm -hmm. standard. And, yeah. and the people who need to sit at that are like the CHHA, the CSA, we have to have Health Canada, it, it has to be a larger group. Yeah. yeah, people yeah. coming together. Yeah, this is I that I was going to mention that as well. I know it's it's irrelevant for the conversation, but the the National Building Code, for example, goes all across Canada. But there's also addendums to that, and and you've got provinces like Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia that mm -hmm. differ from that. So these are all coming into line now. And they're trying to, the federal government is trying to encompass everything into one standard. But there is there is that level of consultation with the industry. Yeah. So, I mean, you guys have that kind of open communication with Health Canada, as well as the province, yes. Wendy, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And we, we've been, uh, we were just recently asked again to, uh, to uh, advise and sit on the committee for the uh, revisions to the best practice cleaning document that mm -hmm. uh, Project develops. We'll be doing that as well. So yeah, we, uh, yeah, we do, but it's, it's almost, it's like, it's a tad confusing. Like, like yeah. we've always had this conversation that somebody that somebody that's cleaning a long-term care facility in Nova Scotia should be cleaning it exactly the same way as somebody that's cleaning it in Ontario. So the guidelines are put forward and like even I even from even between some of our members, they will do they will follow the guideline, but one of those one of those facilities might just go the extra step within their facility mm -hmm. to do something a little bit differently than another facility is doing. Yeah. But yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And like and that becomes problematic too. Because yeah. even if you, even if you're looking at PIDAC right? There's various degrees in which you can meet those standards, yeah. right? And, and not all facilities have the capability of doing the ultimate best thing, right? So I'll do cubicle curtains, for example, right? Cubicle curtains come down when they're visibly soiled, they come down at isolation discharge, they, right? Um, we have a hard time here at Hamilton Health Sciences changing a cubicle curtain, um, in any other circumstances other than a discharge clean, where a smaller facility could take cubicle curtains down two or three times a day every time they get dirty, right? So there, there still has to be some sort of an equalizer or some sort of leveling out. And, mm -hmm. and, and that comes from not just the standards, but once you get the standards established and the cleaning you now have to talk to manufacturers of equipment to make sure they're manufacturing equipment that can be cleaned properly, yeah. right? How many times do you get a piece of equipment in? Oh, no, you can't use accelerated hydrogen peroxide on that. Oh, no, we don't want bleach on that. Or you can use bleach on this part of the equipment, but for the screen, we got to use something else. Or we are going to negate your warranty if you use accelerated hydrogen peroxide or bleach on that. So there's a lot of people that have to come up to speed. And it's not just the people that clean in healthcare. It's the equipment that you're using. It's the access of the supplies that like, it's the access to the supplies that you have, right? Mm -hmm. It's access to vendors and educators that are coming into your facility. You need to have the time to train your new staff properly. Like I live in the milk and honey there, right? They come, <laughs> 
they come to me for three days in my skills lab before they even see patients. They're cleaning for three days before they even see a patient or a frontline staff member, right? So there's a lot of people that have to communicate and buy into those standards, not just healthcare, right? The people that are bringing the equipment into healthcare, the people that are, you know, bringing the supplies in, all that kind of stuff has to get up to speed. And that's going to take us a little bit. Yeah. Wow. So in terms of goals moving forward, where do you see this association going? Well, the world. (laughs) (laughs) We we want to continue uh, growing. We want to, we want to get our message out to, uh, you know, as many people as we possibly can. Um, We've got amazing educational programs. Uh, it would be phenomenal if, if, well, I mean, a lot of facilities now it's, it's standard for their housekeeping, uh, leader, supervisor, manager to have the EVS leadership program, um, as well as the frontline course. So it, it's that push Tanya, just to get that information. Um, you know, we, we provide amazing resources right now to our members. Um, we have a great conference every year, um, working on the theme for next year already. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that, yeah, we, awesome. we just want to grow. We want to, we want to, I mean, I think we are now, I think we are the go-to for, uh, for housekeeping EVS healthcare in uh, Canada because we focus specifically on healthcare. We don't go out of that, uh, go out of that portfolio. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, hopefully we'll, we will be able at some point uh, to translate. Uh, our next course would be the EVS Leadership Program to get that one translated in French as well. Mm-hmm. And we want to continue our partnerships with our uh, colleges. We've had amazing partnerships with Mohawk, Loyalist, uh, St. Lawrence uh, colleges during the pandemic and even after um, offering our program to uh underemployed um, job seekers. So we hope to continue uh, and the hospitality workers training center. We did a lot of work with them too. when uh, when COVID hit, so yeah, just, uh, just to be, uh, we want to be the voice for the uh, EVS housekeeping professionals. I think too, and Wendy and I have talked about this um, in the past and it's like way, way, way kind of in the future, but eventually getting a certain aspect of the organization available to frontline staff. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I like I I think um membership for so yeah, like even my frontline staff, I like I say to my like I'll hear them say, Oh no, I'm just an EA. And I say to them, Oh my gosh, if I hear you say that again, I want to smack you in the head if it wasn't against the law. So I obviously don't, but but I think we need to just have a general all over understanding and feeling from our frontline staff that they are not just cleaners. So you have to kind of think um, they weren't necessarily treated with the same level of respect or understanding and appreciation for the job that they did before COVID. And I'll kind of tell you a little story. And this kind of sets the tone for how a lot of my staff felt before COVID. Um, So when I first got this job, I was job shadowing uh, on a unit and a brand new young nurse came up to me and was looking for something. And I said, can I help you? She said, I'm looking for the little old lady who cleans up after us. (laughs) Right. And so not you guys don't know me, but I have an extremely large, sarcastic, snotty mouth. (laughs) I turned to her and said, well, you're going to have a rough day because unless you brought your mother to work today, you don't have a little old lady who cleans up after you. But I can introduce you to the environmental aid that cleans and disinfects our patients' environments. And so that's generally how they kind of felt. And I would go on a unit, talk to frontline staff, talk to the supervisors. They would express a concern to me. And I'd say, let's take that to clinical staff. Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I don't want to talk to clinical staff about that. That, you know, they're they're nurses. So I think since COVID hit and people understand that we are not cleaners, we do more Uh um, is great. But when you have people working in that environment for years and years and years and years, they're not overnight going to feel that value. Right. So we have to kind of still, we still have a lot to go for staff, staff morale and um, 
frontline staff understanding that they are they are not cleaners they are professionals that nurses and doctors absolutely couldn't do their job if they didn't if they weren't around and so it's going to take a while for people to buy in for frontline staff to kind of buy into that a little Mm -hmm. bit more than what they are now especially the ones that have been in this environment for a long time a while I think too uh, Tanya you and I were just chatting just before the uh the session started and and we did our um frontline uh, award of excellence again this mm-hmm. year during housekeeping week um so managers and supervisors had to nominate a staff member or two they were only supposed to nominate one but some of them nominated more than one <laughs> um but they had there was specific criteria that uh they had to meet so Last year, we did the Award of Excellence, and we had 40, 40, just under 40 nominations come in. This year, we had over 150 nominations wow. come in, and, uh, and I'm going to say probably 85% of them met the criteria, um, so they, they will all receive an Award of Excellence. We had uh, 22 affiliate partners contribute gifts. So I threw all of the names into a hat and uh, that, that met the criteria and, and pulled the 22 names that won prizes. Unfortunately, we have a prize for everybody, but the rest of them, they, they all qualified for this award of excellence. So that's like the feedback that I'm getting from that from different people is just like, this is so awesome. And, you know, it's about time, something like this is done. So I think that's going to help us out as well. And, and that may, maybe that'll help us enter into the, uh, the frontline level of, of a membership. Yeah. Yeah. Next, next steps. I, well, at this point, does anybody in our audience have any questions that they'd like to ask Wendy or Julie? Just pop on if you do. No? Yes? No? Maybe? Well, guys, we only have a couple minutes, so parting thoughts. So can I just extend an invitation to everybody here? So because I work for Hamilton Health Sciences, I work for a teaching and research facility. I'm able to share all of my education materials. So we do have education materials on the CHHA form as well. So but um, if there's anything a little more specific that you need, um, you can reach out through me. So if they reach out to you, Tanya, you have my contact. Information. Absolutely. I yep. can share any of my checklists. I do quick step cards and guidelines for every single thing that staff have to clean, hand hygiene, absolutely everything. And some equipment cleaning posters and things like that. So if anybody needs anything like that, I can send that to you. I will send you my HHA uh, stuff. You can rebrand it with your own stuff and do whatever you want with it after that. I will put them in contact with Wendy. And then Wendy can can connect Absolutely. if that if that works for everybody. And in the meantime, that's our time. So I appreciate everybody joining us today. I think it was a really good conversation. I think we've learned a lot. I know I have about the healthcare industry. I thank you, Wendy. I thank you, Julie, and all of our guests today. And I hope you can join us again next month, uh, October, for the next episode. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thanks, Tanya. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.